picture is the fastest way to get a message and emotion into your brain. And this is why pictures are so successful when it comes to telling stories. Sit up straight, Tom. It's all about the power of faces. You know, you get fascinated by such an image and suddenly he gets a story. Born in 38, right? 39. Oh, 39. That is nice. Most of my, my jobs are for magazines. I, I'm an editorial photographer photographing famous people, you know, athletes, musicians, actors. Besides these assigned jobs, I find personal projects that are meaningful to me. So I was sitting at a bar with a friend of mine, Kai Diekmann. And while we were talking, and I told him I have a Jewish wife, he said he's a chairman of Friends of Yad Vashem. We came up with this idea right then and there to photograph 75, the Holocaust survivors. Next year marks 75 years of the liberation of Auschwitz. Everything was okay until the Germans came in and they said, Jews don't belong here. You want to ice right here? You're doing great, you're so strange. So they sent me out to Estonia for a labor camp, me and my father. Then my, fa my father died on my hands in Estonia from hunger, from work, and he died there. And I remained alone. How many grandchildren do you have? Ten. Ten grandchildren? Right now, ten. Oh, ten grandchildren you're not getting anymore. Two more great grandchildren. You never know. Yeah, you know. <laughs> and that's my story. Oh. Rich man. Yeah. It is actually well. Yeah. Lee and I were. Wer macht Ihnen Ihre Frisur? Ich habe eine gute Frage. Ich habe das seit 30 Jahren. Aber jetzt werden die Haare ein bisschen dünn. Bald muss ich sie alle abschneiden. Growing up in Germany, in high school, we talked about nothing else. It feels like we talked about the Holocaust in English, in French school classes, in history, obviously, in politics class, in German class. We grew up with this incredible sense of guilt and really shock and questioning one's identity. How come that the people from my country have been able to commit these horrendous crimes? It's very scary to see what's happening in Europe right now that anti-Semitism is coming back so, so strongly. You know, I feel more responsible than ever to make sure something like this can never happen again and to fight anti-Semitism wherever I see it. Were you at Auschwitz when it was liberated? Yeah. Wow. We were, my sister and I, I was with my 13-year-old sister. And we were in Mengele's barracks. It was beyond description, my monster. Did you guys give me that picture out of my, uh, the, the newspaper? You're not, you're, you're not in this picture, right? You... Yes, we are. You are? That's my sister, Eva. Oh, my gosh. And that's me. We were 10 and 10, 13 year olds. I remember seeing a woman, and she had a little child next to her. And uh, these two guards were laughing. The next thing we saw, they went to the woman, pulled the child away from her, put the child on the floor, grabbed one arm and the opposite leg, put his boot on the child's stomach and pulled the child apart, literally apart. That's the sort of thing that was going on all the time. And somehow we survived. It was pure luck, really. So you work at the museum pretty much every day? You come here to... Yeah. 
every day. Every day. Wow. You have a lot of energy. <laughs> uh, I don't intend to lose uh, in a day of my life. Okay, where are you from? I'm Israel. I'm Israel. 1941, Germans were arresting Jews on the street. So my mother one day prepared for me a suitcase. I thought I was going on some sort of vacation. Okay. I was taken to a farm. In that farm, I met a lady called Madame Machana. I was nine years old. We had the food, we were safe. I got my own room. There were three children. There was a son, Marcel. And I can tell you that he has been my big brother for the next 70 years. I can only thank Madame Machana with all my heart. Because I could have been one of these million five hundred thousand children. There is only smoke left of them. And I owe her my life. We've got a big challenge now that the survivors of the Holocaust, they are getting fewer and fewer because, you know, simply they are now in their 90s. Uh, over 100 years old, so we are losing their testimony. And to make their stories available is extremely important. And this is everything Yad Vashem is about. We have to use this testimony to connect these experiences with youngsters who are coming to learn. Very important. Young people have to be part of that responsibility to fight against racism, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism is part of it. Is that a Hasselblad that you're using? No, it's a Mamiya. It's similar to a Hasselblad. I was three years old when my mother brought me to the man who hit me. When a father came back from concentration camp and I went to live with him, a few months later we had a visitor. She called out Moishele, that was my name as a baby. And uh, she hugged me and kissed me and began to cry. And father too began to cry. And father said, look Maurice, this is your mother, Helen. Truth is, uh, Helen was my mother's sister. Mother died in Auschwitz. She discovered that her sister had died, so she looked for ways to find me immediately. to find a sister's son. She was my only mother and always be my mother. And so it was. I am the youngest girl in Schindler List. The war ended, <laughs> 45. We sit there in the factory. Schindler prepared for every one of us a pack put a blanket, vodka, something to wear, not to go like prisoners, that everyone will have something to start. It is not in the Schindler List film, but it's true. I put him with my mother and with God, you know. So I'm here in my resistance group in France and I'm the only male. All the rest are Jewish girls. I was in the Jewish Salvation Resistance for 13 and a half years. 13 and a half? No, three and a half years. Three and a half years. Sit down just a little bit. What? A little bit lower? Yeah. I am not good at lowering my head. <laughs> <laughs> and, your and your mother and your brother did not survive? They did not survive. How did you survive? Oh, today I have children and grandchildren and grand-grandchildren. I have turned my life to build up a country for my people and defend it. And again, I am one of a generation. I arrived in Israel a very long time ago. Went to the market. All the people there were Jews. 
I suddenly understood that I had been in hiding all my life. And it has been a very special feeling to be part of, in France, I was never part of. My son is a PhD in microbiology. And I always say that from the ashes of Auschwitz, Maybe my son will find a, a solution of uh, this terrible sickness called cancer. So four so, kids. I have four kids. Great. Twenty-two grandchildren. Twenty-two. Masa Albertracha, she wishes you a lot of luck. Thank you. Shalom, 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 shalom. You turn it into a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very well. Shalom. And for Thank your you. smiling and for you being the way you are. I do think you have a responsibility for your history. You know, if everybody looked at their own history and tried to learn from their own history and try to use that knowledge to better themselves, to better society, I think that's what will bring us all as humans forward. So this was, uh, I think, eight years, eight days after I left the ghetto. And it was two days, not two day, one day after my dad left me alone in the forest. She wants to add that uh, they suggest me to to choose a form of death. Hmm? To choose the form of death. Oh, or chanika, or to 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 burn her. To burn me. And I was very, very frightened. Very frightened. I don't like it. And I was frightened, especially because I, yesterday I was with my father, and now they want to kill me, and I am only myself. And I said to myself, I want to, I want, I want to, to leave. I don't want to, to, I want to leave. I very want to leave, because my father, Tell me that I must leave. 